This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. First, this episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today and use code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. And do us a favor. If you like the pod and you want to support it, again, go to over to Prize Picks and use that code CLNS to sign up. It will help us tremendously. Greg, let's start here. League meetings, pro days are now done. Uh, you spoke to some executives. I, I want to start with Jaden Daniels. What kind of intel did you get on Jaden? Yeah, I've been, Nick, I've been sort of blown away by um, the sort of consensus. And, and you know, I, I'm a guy who I think I think Jaden Daniels, and, and I haven't done my deep dive on him. I will start probably um, next week. Like, I've pretty much done May. Uh, I'm skipping over Caleb Williams because everybody knows he's going number one. Um, <laughs> yeah. Jaden Daniels, uh, <laughs> there's a lot to like about him. Um, there certainly are concerns about his size, how he plays, his ability to stay healthy. Um, you know, but you know, at his pro day, I think he measured in at almost six foot four, um, two hundred and ten pounds, uh, almost nine and a half inch hands. I mean, that's I mean, that's really good size. I mean, the the weight isn't there, but I do think you talk to NFL people and they say um, you could see him putting on weight over time, getting to 225, maybe something like that in time. Um, so as far as, but the evaluation as far as Jaden Daniels, I've been blown away. I, so I talked to six executives at the league meetings, guys who I have longstanding relationships with. Um, I really respect them on the quarterbacks. And just sort of, you know, taking the pulse on them on, on the top guys, and um, I I was blown away by they are absolutely resolute that Jaden Daniels is by far the second quarterback in this draft. All of them, all six, all six says Caleb number one. All six say Jaden Daniels number two. They just think that he is he's just he's just special in terms of you know his he's got the running ability of Lamar Jackson. But he has the potential to be a much better downfield thrower. Now, there are some questions about what sort of offense does he fit best in. Do, would he really be an ideal fit for a West Coast type offense like the Patriots, where you gotta make certain reads and it's 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 somewhat similar to the old Patriot system, as opposed to say, uh, you know, what the Ravens ran this past year. Um, sort of like a high low thing, um, giving them options where basically the, it's it's an options offense where it's like, all right, if this guy does this, then you're going to that receiver. Um, so there are some questions about that, but Jaden's ability to throw from the pocket, especially deep, married with his game breaking running ability, people in the NFL are just salivating about him as a prospect, and they think he is clear cut, no doubt number two in this draft. Any mention of his receivers? I, I know some people say, well, mm. you know, he had neighbors. He had Brian Thomas Jr. He had those kinds of guys that can go deep, make plays on the football. A any thought about them helping him so much that he might not be the same guy when he gets to the NFL unless he has talent like that on the outside? I think that's legit, Nick. That's that's a legitimate question to ask. Um, surprisingly, nobody brought that up. Um, and I will say that the film that I have seen of Jaden Daniels right now, it, it, um, it, it answers those questions that, you know, I mean, he's throwing into, even to these guys who are great. It's not exactly Mac Jones at Alabama where a lot of guys are just streaming free. There are a ton of throws deep on the boundary, tight windows, dropping in a bucket. There are a ton of those throws on film. So, I think that people think as long as you have, you know, some sort of representative um, offense in the NFL, and it looks like, I mean, I, I guess we would have to bet that he goes to Washington at two. Um, apparently, Brian Kelly, the LSU coach, slipped the <laughs> a slip of the tongue at the pro day, basically like saying like he's going to Washington. And, you know, you look at the mix with Cliff Kingsbury, who is the offensive coordinator there, what he likes to do. He does run that sort of high-low offense. Um, you know, has had Kyler Murray before, so he understands the dynamic running ability of some of these guys. Um, and the other thing I would say about Daniels going to to Washington, you know, Adam Peters is the GM now, and 
just remember, he was driving the bus in San Francisco for Trey Lance when they traded up in that draft. He, Him and John Lynch sort of bullied Kyle Shanahan into taking Trey Lance. And I think I, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if Adam Peters looked at Jaden Daniels, his running ability and his throwing ability, and be like, this is the guy I wanted Trey Lance to be, but this guy is actually the guy. He has the talent. He has the mix of running and passing. And um, so I think that – and if he goes to Washington – Tons of weapons there, McLaurin and company. We saw them last year with Sam Howell against the Patriots. I was very impressed with what they have. Um, certainly some work to do on the offensive line and other places and on defense, but uh, that would be a pretty good – between offensive coordinator and weapons, it would pretty, be a pretty good alignment, in my opinion, with Daniels to Washington. Yeah, some will tell you, you know, again, oh, he had these great receivers, and he did have great receivers, but – if you watch Daniel's throw, it's a lot about ball placement as well. Like where, yep. where he's putting the football in traffic down, you know, outside the hash, making those throws pinpoint accuracy on a lot of those deep throws and, and great touch. So it, it has more to do with just the talent around him. All right. What were people telling you about Drake may? So I was a little surprised by this, um, this, you know, s- same sort of panel of six people. Um, they're sort of a little bit, um, I wouldn't say all over the map, but uh, 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 there was much more concern about May or at least uh, pause about May. Now, they all say he's ridiculously talented. And um, if you didn't believe that before, the 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 show that he put on in his pro day um, to me was uh, terrific. Now, I'm not a big pro day guy, and I don't really care about, yeah, he missed two throws out of like, I don't know, like 50. Um, Jaden Daniels missed more. Uh, Caleb, Caleb Williams might've missed more. JJ McCarthy didn't. He had the best pro day out of all these guys. But in terms of, uh, you know, May and his pro day, like just some of the throws that he made off balance with a guy in front of him, like flicking the wrist, like it was just in the deep ball accuracy. It was just, it was astounding to me. And, um, it's sort of, you know, I, I'm, I've been a little bit wish-washy on Drake May. Um, and before before we get to that, let me tell you about the so so the so the NFL people are basically wish-washy on Drake May. Now, this when I talked to them, this was before his pro day, but I don't think pro days don't matter that much. So I don't think it would have changed. May, maybe like one vote, maybe if they were in the same boat as me, which is you know I like Drake May, but I need to see a little bit more. Um, so they were split. They respect the talent, and it's there. It's real. Um, sometimes it's breathtaking, the talent that he has. But I think a lot of, or at least some NFL people, um, they didn't like this past year at North Carolina. Yeah, there were a lot of things wrong uh, around him. Um, you know, there's sometimes there's a lot of things wrong around you in the NFL. Like, I mean, you know, look at Mac Jones. And, you know, some people say that, Mac Jones, they wouldn't cut him any slack because he couldn't make up for the deficiencies in coaching and the offensive line and the receivers, and nobody cut him any slack and said he needs to elevate people. But when it comes to Drake May, they say that, well, you could just excuse it. it, it things weren't, weren't good around him, so, so just ignore it. Uh, I, I don't understand that. But in terms of the NFL, they were split. Um, two people I talked to said the Patriots should stick and pick him because – that's how talented he is, and you, he just needs a little bit of time, and the the, the payoff could be huge. Um, two said they would take J.J. McCarthy at two because they are afraid of Drake May's floor, which mm. we heard Gerard Mayo talk about at the league meetings right. sort of out of nowhere. And two said they would trade down. They would trade out of the pick, accumulate more picks, start the rebuild, ta- uh, target one of the secondary quarterbacks, and sort of go from there. So that's that's sort of where we are on Drake May at this point in time. Now, I will say real quickly, uh, I I'm taking a I'm I'm taking a huge swing on Drake May. I don't care. That talent is just it's too good. He's 21 years old. There's too much room to grow. I believe in Alex Van Pelt and Mac- Ben McAdoo coaching him up, and 
you know, I, I just think I think the talent is way too much for the Patriots at this point in time to pass up on. If Drake May is there at three, I agree with you. I would run the card up to the podium. Uh, I, I would absolutely do that and feel good about it. 21 years old, I think, is very important to continue to stress. I, I did have a couple thoughts, though. One thought and then one question for you. The pro day with, with Drake May, I don't know if I heard a lot of people talk about this. I, I talked about it for a few minutes on my podcast last week, the Nick Cattle Show. little plug for you. But I was talking about Drake's pro day, and what stood out to me, Greg, was I, I don't know if it stood out to you, but was the challenge of the pro day. And, and what I mean by mm-hmm. that is May knows he's very likely going to go top three. It could have been easy for him to go out there, make 45 to 50 scripted throws, do the things that he's best at, wipe his hands, walk out and be like, there I am. I'm top three pick. See ya. See you on draft night. He didn't do that. He he went 70 plays. He gave you red zone. He gave you deep throws. He gave a lot of bootleg action back to the offensive line, quote unquote, under center. Uh, He went for more than 30 minutes. And I just thought to myself, I remember reading an article about Jalen Brown before the draft. I fell in love with Jalen Brown the moment I read how he was working out with Jimmy Butler on the beaches, running through the sand with 95 degree weather going 6 a.m. to like 6 p.m. And I was like, that dude with his athletic talent if he cares that much and he works that much, yeah, I'm in on that guy. And I just thought that jumped out at me with May. You know, Daniels, not to say he wasn't, you know, he wasn't good. He was good in his pro day, but I thought May really took the challenge of, I want to prove to all of you how much I can do, given, again, pro days are pro days. I, I completely agree with you. I thought it was an extremely challenging pro day. I couldn't believe for how long. He was throwing. I really liked the way he sort of directed his teammates, uh, working off the script, the the, the huddle that he ran, um, you know, along with just the, the the downfield accuracy that he had. I thought I, I think you're exactly right. You know, when you compare Drake May and Jaden Daniels, their two pro days, I thought Drake Mays was much more challenging and his ability to throw off platform. You know, he'd do an RPO and throw off the wrong foot and those sorts of things and just his ability and the zip on the ball. I mean, it's just, it's real and it's impressive. All right. Rapid fire. Three questions for you. Number one, uh, I I was reading Evan Lazar last week after the pro days and Chip Lindsay, who is the UNC offensive coordinator, made it a point speaking to the media to say, Hey, look, I I know a lot of people are discussing May's footwork and he needs, he absolutely needs help with the footwork and he needs to polish that up. But Lindsay he had said that they changed May's dropbacks. The offense was different. May was used to dropping back a certain way in 2022. They changed that up in 2023. And Lindsay said, I, you know, I thought he did a decent job of kind of transitioning at his age of dealing with that. If you're Alex Van Pelt, do you buy that? Do you buy that explanation that, you know, maybe the footwork was a little spotty because the dropback had him in different rhythm and he just tried to get used to it? No, no. Um, I, I I reject that. It it's on film, and in the footwork problems, we're not talking about like dropping back from center or anything like that. We're talking about that Drake May. And look, the offensive line maybe wasn't that great, and maybe it affected him. Um, you know, but number one, he 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 has a tendency to drift, and he even admitted this. I think at the combine, like he drifts in the pocket, like yeah. for no reason. Um, that's not a drop back issue. That's a He's not sure what he's going to get. Maybe the guys are covered, that sort of thing. So he drifts. And the other thing is when he's under duress, he's, his footwork for such a big, strong guy, like his his feet get very narrow. And instead of throwing with a good base, he you know it looks like he gets a little bit scared. So his feet get narrow. And so his balance is off and that throws off his mechanics. And this shows up, and I was talking with Gasper about this because we've sort of gone back and forth. Uh, on on May on on Sunday night on TV, but it's not like like I, I'm not looking at Drake May and seeing his struggles from last year, and it's not about like nobody's open or he's not getting blocking to me. And this goes for all the analysts who you know have looked at this and sort of we we both we all see this the same whether it's Dan Orlovsky or Greg Cosell or you know people like that. Um, 
it's the easy throws that he missed because of his footwork, because of drifting, because his weight gets off balance. I mean, you just go watch the NC State game from last year and the amount of just gimme throws, guys are open, just little checkdowns and stuff that he was just completely missing. Those are the issues. Like if he was, if he was like fine on that stuff, but maybe couldn't find people downfield or the blocking, then I'd say like, okay, I understand. It's it's the easy throws that he misses that causes people the most concern. All right, we have more on May. We have more on the draft. Uh, some mock drafts out there, including a recent report about Elliot Wolf's fascination with J.J. McCarthy. Before we get into all of that, Greg, tell the people about prize picks. March is over, but the biggest moments in college basketball tip off the month of April. Be part of the action on prize picks for both men's and women's college basketball. Prize Picks has something for every sports fan, from basketball and hockey to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron, Caitlin Clark, Connor McDavid, and Jude Bellingham all in the same entry. Uh, I had just the other night, I had Caitlin Clark for more than 30 points oh. and LeBron James for more than seven three pointers, and I hit it. Download the Prize Picks app today and use code CLNS for the first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's a match up to $100 by using code CLNS. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy over at Price Picks. All right, Drake May, the script. Seemed to me it was aimed at Alex Van Pelt, and, and that could be an overreaction. But is there any thought like, hey, all right, I could go to the Patriots at three. I want to prove to these guys that I can do a lot off the bootleg action under center back to the offense and defensive lines. Do you feel like may try to make that a point, especially running that kind of, Hey, I can, I can do the West coast offense thing, Alex. I will say that I thought it was not Patriots specific, but I thought it was a blend of basically every type of passing off uh, element that you need in the NFL for varying, you know, offensive uh, schemes. So, you know, plenty of, I, I love the under center stuff and I loved how he flipped back and forth because he would do under center. He would do shotgun. He would do RPO throws. He would do, you know, boots. So I think that anybody from, you know, Alex Van Pelt to Brian Dayball to Kevin O'Connell to, um, you know, the Raiders, in uh I'm trying to think Antonio, uh, uh, Antonio Pierce uh Luke Getze, their offensive coordinator. Um I think that they basically every offense was able to to see something and say that translates to us, that works with us. So that's the way I took it. I forgot where I heard it or read it because there's so much out there right now. I apologize to the person who had this unique idea or this idea. Wanted to pass it along to you, Greg. I heard somebody recently say in the past few days that Dan Quinn might lean towards Jaden Daniels because as a defensive mind, it's much more difficult to defend somebody like Daniels than it is May because Daniels, obviously, the athleticism, the running ability. May's athletic, by the way, and can run. He's just not at the level of Daniels. Patriots, right. last time I checked, they have a defensive-minded head coach. Do you think Gerard Mayo would lean towards Daniels over May with the same idea? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, now, now, what would be my answer? Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't know where you read it. Um, I think that's maybe you read it on Reddit. Uh, <laughs> I, to me, I think that's uh, that's reaching a, a bit. I mean, I think we're into now. We're into April. The draft is getting closer. It's been a long, hard process. Um, I, to me, I really don't think these head coaches have a – I don't think they have a huge say in terms of the quarterback, especially in Washington. I mean, Adam Peters was hired first. He hired the coach. He's in charge. Now, you could say that's a little bit different in New England um, where you know they're all sort of communing and sitting by the fire and kumbaya, we're all going to – we're all in a we're all in the same silo instead of different silos and collaboration and all that crap. Um, it, it could be a little bit different in New England. I just think Adam Peters is the guy. He's gonna 
he's going to pick the quarterback. The head coach is going to go along. I mean, sure, I'm sure they're going to weigh in and things like that. Um, I think both of them, when you're talking about a defensive head coach, I think you're just – you're looking – yeah, it's hard to defend Jaden Daniels. Um, you also probably think that you could pulverize him and he won't make it out of week six. You know, we've all seen the injury issues that Lamar Jackson has had uh, in his career, but – I think that when you look at the talent of Drake May, I don't know how any any coach could look at him and say, like, well, that guy's easier to defend. I mean, he is very athletic. He can throw anywhere. He's like, to me, he's Josh Allen light. He's like somewhere, he's lesser than Josh Allen, same sort of traits, but also, you know, Justin Herbert. So I think he's he's below those guys by a little bit, could get to their level at some point, just because, like we said, about his age. His build, um, love the family background with the dad, the former quarterback, the brothers who are professional athletes. He's the run of the litter. You knew he used to get the crap kicked out of him. It's very similar to Brady. Yeah, he had sisters, but they were all kick-ass athletes. And Tom was sort of the run of the litter and had to fight for everything. And so um, I just think think, uh, both of them present different difficulties, but I, I think that's reaching to say a defensive head coach would want uh, the, the 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 more versatile quarterback. I think part of the thought process was looking at the Cowboys' schedule last year and who that defense had a tough time against. And, you know, when, when you look at some of the some of the quarterback matchups, Cowboys gave up some points to to quarterbacks that that can run. Maybe that was part of it, too. But the point is the point. All right. Uh, so we know Patriots, obviously, the evaluators you spoke to, uh, they they were split 2-2-2 two, two, and two on what the Patriots should do in the draft at number three. Uh, not necessarily in love with the Drake May option. Uh, and, and you and I talked about Drake May. If he was there at three, both of us would run up and, and make that pick. Yep. So let's look at some mock drafts here. We got two. And before we jumped on, you mentioned this one to me. I had not seen it. It was released an hour ago. Bedard all over this stuff. Guy's just like on his phone with his big thumbs. Oh, yeah. I'm all over it. (laughs) So Lance Zerline of uh, NFL.com came out with his latest. And he's got Caleb Williams one. No shocker. Daniel's going two. Then with the Patriots at three, Zerline has the Patriots trading with the Giants. The The Giants coming up from six to draft Drake May. And then the Patriots, they end up uh, using the sixth pick on Malik Neighbors. So that is the trade that is done. I'm trying to find this. You saw you saw this in full. Does he write exactly what picks in the second round, or he just says they move down to six? No, he, he doesn't write. So this is what he writes about. He said, in this three-spot move up the board, the Giants probably have to pay more than the standard trade chart would indicate since the supply side of the quarterback position is dwindling. But the demand remains high. This is, you know, when it comes for trading up for a quarterback, there's a premium. That's just the way it works. Brian Dayball fostered Josh Allen's raw talents in Buffalo and could have a chance to do the same with this toolsy but inconsistent North Carolina product. I completely agree with his reasoning as far as Dayball, Allen, Dayball could see this is this guy's a lot like Josh Allen. I was able to 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 mold him into what he is. I could definitely see that. So. He doesn't say specifically what the trade is, but looking at what the Giants have, I think it would, it's at least, it, it's definitely 47, I would say. That's their second round pick, is 47. And then there's got to be a sweetener. So it could be their third round pick um, to me, or it could be a future second or first round. Um, to me, it's all about the value of the trade. Uh, I, the theory of trading down from three to six, um, I don't mind, and I'm not going to reject it. Yes, I'm leaning heavily towards just taking Drake May, as we talked about, Nick, uh, but I'm certainly listening to this offer. Uh, it, if if it's a two and a future first for moving up three spots, I have to seriously consider this. Now, I'm not taking Malik Neighbors at six. I'm sorry. I'm taking Joe Alt, and then I'm using the ammunition, either the second-round pick or the future first, to trade back up and get my next quarterback. I prefer Penix. Um, uh, J.J. McCarthy in this mock draft goes – sorry, the Vikings trade up to five 
No, excuse me. To four. Where is this? With the to card. four. Sorry, they traded. They trade up to four to take J.J. McCarthy. So McCarthy's off the board. I would take Penix. I prefer him over, you know, Bo Nix or Spencer Rattler or any of those guys. Um, but depending on if the Giants for, to move up three picks are willing to give you a bounty, a second and a future first, I have to seriously consider that. Well, I go back to Daniel Jeremiah of the NFL Network. He mentioned this going back a, a couple of uh, weeks ago, a few weeks ago on his conference call. He said, talking to some people, for the Giants to move up to three, it would take three future seconds. And so his deal was, well, three seconds, wow. not, three, not three future seconds, but three seconds. So his deal was 39-47 in this year's draft, and then next year's second round pick. And So the Giants have 39? Yeah, they got 39 and 47. Okay, because so I just looked at, okay, go ahead. I think they do. I mean, unless uh, unless Jeremiah was wrong, but he, he said two second round picks this year and a second round pick in twenty twenty five. So, so sorry one one um, breaking in on that. the The Giants shipped thirty nine to the Panthers for Brian Burns, so that oh, pick is not there. All right, anymore. so that has that yeah. has been traded since that has been traded since Jeremiah said that. So they did have the pick, they did have yep. that pick. So now they only have forty seven. Uh, and then 70. So, I mean, look, if it was 39, 47 in a future second, then that's a no brainer. Uh, I would do that if I didn't love the quarterback there, but I, I would hold off. I, I feel like you, if I'm going to move out of the three spot, I need a future first. I feel like, and yep. even if I'm only going down to six, I, I still feel like I need that future first round pick from the Giants. So I would take the, the second round pick this year and I would take next year's first uh, if they were into that idea. All right. Another mock draft we wanted to talk about was Tony Pauline from Sports Kita. He released his mock draft, and, and he had the Patriots drafting J.J. McCarthy. And he had a report with that. Some people might say mock drafts aren't reports. But within the pick, he did report some things. Uh, he said that the buzz around the com- – not the combine, the pro days, the pro day circuit, the buzz was the Patriots wanted J.J. McCarthy and that Elliot Wolf is, quote-unquote, pushing hard for McCarthy – and believes he has as much upside as any quarterback in this draft. Just your initial reaction, Greg, to the pushing hard Elliot Wolf regarding JJ McCarthy. Well, I'll say that um, I've known Tony for years. He's been around a long time. He's had various jobs. Um, I will say he's he's pretty good at his job. He's good at the draft, talking to people. He's a He's a big rumor monger. Uh, I can't tell you the accuracy of his stuff, but just in terms of my own believability that Wolf would think this way, uh, I'm a little bit doubtful on this. I'm a little dubious on this, just from this aspect. And again, with a lot of this stuff, because Elliot's sort of a blank slate in terms of we don't know what he's going to do. He's never directed a draft. He's always been in the second in command or third in command. So we don't exactly know, but just going off history, especially his genes, which means his dad, Ron Wolf, Ron Wolf believed in getting the dynamic passer. Um, yeah, you know, leadership and toughness, which we heard uh, Wolf talk about, certainly vital, and you need to start there. But um, Ron Wolf came from the thinking of he was going to bet on sort of the, uh, how do I put this? The big swinging Schmenzer at <laughs> quarterback. Like he wasn't, he wasn't this meek guy. Let me get a game manager. Now I'm not saying JJ McCarthy. We don't know what he's going to be because Michigan was just, they were built a certain way. They played a certain way through their defense. Um, so it's hard to tell exactly what JJ McCarthy is capable of. Um, but, you know, you look at, you know, Ron Wolf, especially, you know, his his trade of uh, Brett Favre, um, some of his other moves. He always, Ron Wolf believes one of his fr- number one tenets was if you don't have a great quarterback, a transcendent quarterback, you don't have a very good shot at winning a Super Bowl. Everything else has to be perfect. He wants the guy that elevates everybody. And, at this point in time, and I could be wrong, but where J.J. McCarthy is right now, I don't think you can say that, and I would be surprised if Elliot Wolf 
believe that J.J. McCarthy was one of those transcendent quarterbacks that has the potential to be great in this league. I would be surprised about that. I have a lot of thoughts about J.J. McCarthy and, and the Pauline stuff and, and what Elliot Wolf could be thinking. But before I get to that and a few questions for you, what do you make of all the McCarthy talk? To me, Greg, at this point, it's really starting to feel like a smokescreen. I mean, there's just so much every week about McCarthy being said, and all of it is pretty much glowing. And it really started since as as soon as the season ended, it was McCarthy could go up. McCarthy could be a top 10 guy. Don't be surprised if McCarthy's top five. And Jim Harbaugh out there saying, I think he's the best quarterback in the draft. Everything is positive about this guy coming out. Everything is how he's rocketing up, you know, draft boards. If you're Elliot Wolf, do, do you think that your uh, poop detectors are popping up a little bit with all this McCarthy jazz? Yeah, probably. I mean, I, I just don't. Um... Look, there's certainly a lot to like about J.J. McCarthy. You know, he's a, he's a winner. Um, he was able to play within a system. He's got um, – I like the snap that he has in his throws. He's like he's like Mac Jones but more talented, more athletic, better thrower, um, has really good stats on third downs, other, you know, crucial stats, uh, you know, Got to have it drives. I mean, I just remember that. I I forget. I don't know if it was the national championship game or the semifinal. And again, I don't watch a lot of college football. Um, but he had, I don't know if it was fourth down or third down and long. And he had some in cut that he hung in the pocket and put it like right where it needed to be over the middle. I mean, that shows stones. So I, I definitely see the potential. But, you know, I, there's so many games where he didn't even throw 20 passes and you could say all you want about Michigan was built through their defense and Harbaugh wants to play this way. But again, in Nick, I bring this up all the time when we talk about, um, you know, whether it's Patriots players or other NFL players, like, uh, you should, you should, when the coaches tell you something, you should listen. If JJ McCarthy was this transcendent quarterback that, uh, that was, potential to be the you know Heisman Trophy winner and the best player in the in the country and capable of all these great things the coaching staff would put him in position he would he would be the offense the offense would run through him it did not run through him and in fact yes he he made some there are some he has really good stats on third down he he's made some really good crucial plays but there's also a lot of plays where you're like third and 5 third and 10 and they're running a quarterback keeper or they're handing the ball off, like very conservative. So it makes you wonder, like, what do the coaches know that we don't know? When the coaches tell you something that they're not, they're not putting this guy in position to to be the star or or to lead things. Listen to them. And so, yeah, I'm surprised by it. I don't think Wolf will listen to it. All right. So McCarthy and the Patriots. Here, here's the only reasonable thing I could come up with as far as why they might like him. I don't think they'll pick him at three. I would not pick him at three. Judging off yep. of what you just said, Greg, you would not pick him at three. However, let's try to put this together and, and have some fun, Greg. I, I mentioned this hypothetical on my podcast earlier today. So let's say Elliot Wolf thinks J.J. McCarthy could be really good. He's not there right now, but he could be really good. And Wolf is looking at this through a 2025 lens. And he's saying to himself, if McCarthy was drafted next year, he's a top three pick. He's a top five pick. So I don't love the idea of McCarthy at 11, uh, I mean at three, but I, I do really like slash love the idea of McCarthy at 11. And if Wolf isn't buying all of the smokescreen stuff and he thinks McCarthy could find his way down to 11 because Minnesota really wants Drake May at three, then if you kind of put that together, Greg, does it make sense? If Wolf is looking at this and says, all right, I can walk out of this draft. Let's say it's 11-23 and a first next year. Okay, so I can walk out of this draft with McCarthy at 11. 23, I can pick my tackle. 34-68, let's say we double dip at wide receiver. And then I'm going into next year's draft with my quarterback of the future, my left tackle of the future, two wide receivers that are young and developing and building, and I have two firsts in 2025. I, I, now, 
I would I would take Drake May, as I have stated. I would take Drake May. I would take Jaden uh, Daniels at three. That's what I would do. But I do think it's reasonable. I don't think it's a crazy thing if Wolf looked at it and said those things. What do you think of that hypothetical? Yeah, I'm I'm on board with you. I mean, I, I just think the Patriots are in a position. And again, I don't think that they're, you know, yeah, they're they're in a tough spot and they're probably two years away um, this upcoming season. And then the ne- so, you know, a year away, I guess um, this is sort of like a rebuilding year of, um, you know, really sort of threatening for the postseason and, and doing something um, being heard from again. Um, you know, so I understand um, the sentiment of, you know, building up the team and you're still getting a good quarterback up. You know, a lot of it's going to come down to and this is going to be the tough part of this draft because I do think, and this is every draft, there are so many teams that are QB needy that uh, you don't know what's going to happen. And, yeah. and, you know, you might look back at, you know, yeah, trading back and, you know, maybe I have a shot at J.J. McCarthy, uh, but maybe that might not happen. But I do, I, I don't, I'm assessing everything and I don't mind your scenario where that you laid out, including, you know, having multiple picks in the future, but I'm building a, building up on the young core that the Patriots have. And I think that's going to be the secret to their success long-term. And you led me perfectly to like my, my thought process where like, if, if you are thinking that, if you're Wolf, again, I want to make it clear, I would draft the guy with the high ceiling at three. I would take the big swing. But if you are Wolf and you're thinking, I'm not in love with Mayor Daniels and I can move down to 11 and get McCarthy and supplement him with better talent. I would say, obviously, inherently, there's a risk. And Greg brought up the first thing, which is you could lose your guy. You move down to 11. You can't move back up. Somebody leapfrogs you. Uh Uh-oh. Yep. (laughs) Now now we might have to pick Bo Nix at like 23 or Michael Penix at 23 or 34 and figure it out. And you don't want to be in that situation. I would also just say this. It's about the eval. If you're going to make that kind of a move, it's all about the board and how you read the board and what you know around the league and your evaluation. And we've seen teams, Baltimore Ravens, move up into the first round after drafting Hayden Hurst at 25 and draft Lamar Jackson. They had Hayden Hurst obviously rated above Lamar Jackson in that draft room. (laughs) So think about that for a second. But Mm -hmm. they looked like geniuses because, I mean, Hayden Hurst didn't end up being an an all-pro or anything, I don't think. Uh, Not from my recollection, but nobody goes, oh, man, you took Hayden Hurst before you took Lamar Jackson. Nobody cares about that. So in two years from now, J.J. McCarthy is a good to very good NFL quarterback, and you got all the things that you around him that are necessary to help him get there because you made that trade down. We saw it with the Celtics, different league, obviously, but you moved from one to three because you loved Jason Tatum, but you knew the board. You knew that Philadelphia was picking Markel Fultz, which allowed you to make the deal, i.e. Minnesota Vikings picking Drake May, and you knew that the Lakers wanted Lonzo Ball. And because you knew that, you knew you could get Jason Tatum at three, and that's exactly what you did. You ended up with the best player out of that draft and picking up a future first-round pick in one of the most outrageous trades Danny Ainge ever pulled. So you got to know the board. you got to trust your evaluations. And, of course, everything is just, you know, you're throwing some darts as well. All right. Just two more things for Greg before we bid you adieu today. But I do want to remind you the episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, largest daily fantasy sports platform in North America. Download the app today. Use that code CLNS for a first deposit match up to 100 bucks. And of course, Greg over at BSJ, check him out 50 bucks for the year. Great coverage of the Patriots between Greg and uh, Mike Giardi. All right, quick update on Matthew Judon. Mike Cadlick at EEI spoke with Judon, who apparently opened up a restaurant down in Dallas, so congratulations to him on that. Good luck. Food business ain't easy. Uh, Judon said this, quote, I think with the contract stuff, if it happens, it happens. If we can get a new contract worked out to where I try to end my career in Boston, that'd be great. Um, So first of all, Judon's telling us, yeah, I want a long-term deal. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. if we can get a new Again. deal worked out and I can retire in Boston, I'm, I'm all in on that. What do you think happens with Judon? Um, you know, I, I think that, I think that Wolf has left himself a lot of options. Um, I think, you know, bringing back Uche and Anthony Jennings, 
um, along with the draft coming up. Um, I think that Wolf could go any number of directions. Now, part of me, and I think I've said this before, that since they didn't add a premium edge player, which I thought they might do, I thought they might swap out Judon for somebody else, like we talked about, like Daniil Hunter or somebody like that. They did not do that. Uh, so it would seem to indicate that Judon would be back. I mean, he's sort of, I mean, he's basically their only blue chip player. He's their only elite player. So why wouldn't you have him back? But I think, I think, I think what's going to happen is we're going to have to wait for the draft to see what they do. If, and if they take an edge guy up higher than many of us think, I mean, I think they could go all offense in this draft or at least a majority of it, maybe take a cornerback or free safety, something like that. But if they get an edge guy, um, it's 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 very possible that they move on from Judon. Judon, but as of right now, I think they'll figure out some sort of smart deal to keep him here. But I I think it's really it'll only extend it by like a year or two. Um, I don't think they're going to make a huge investment in him. By the way, Judon also told the EI that the plan is for him to be in Foxborough for the start of uh, the off season program. So six days from now, we'll we'll see if that happens, and we'll see how much he's participating. Uh, last one for you. Bill Belichick didn't get to this. It came out late last week. Sounds like Billy B might be writing a book or at least Burge, somebody that knows him's writing a book about Bill Belichick. Um, doesn't sound though, like it's going to be a drama filled shot fest at the Patriots. Right, Greg? Yeah. Uh, not yet, at least for that book. Um, from what I hear, Bill's eyeing writing multiple books when he's done. Now he doesn't think he's quite done, but for now, as as sort of a project, um, he from this was a scuttlebutt at the league meetings, and I don't know how true it is, but the scuttlebutt at the league meetings was Belichick's writing a book. It's about leadership geared more towards businesses, and it is being written and maybe just ghost written by Bears Nigerian, his former uh, director of football, uh, administrative assistant with the Patriots, who is now. Bill O'Brien's chief of staff at Boston College. That's at least the the rumor mill at the league meetings. Hmm. Billy B. All of a sudden, does that does that interest you? He's going to write many many volumes. Apparently, look at all my leather bound books. He's gonna he's gonna become a, an author <laughs> when he when he when he retires. <laughs> Didn't see that one coming. Hey, uh, by the way, Bill Bill, call me. The things we talked about before. Still interested? Call me. I'm available. Oh, look at you! Uh, I don't. I don't anticipate Bill Belichick writing anything uh, controversial. Not at least not not right now. I, I don't see it. Uh, he he still wants to coach, and he's not going to do that. He's not going to come out and uh, write a scathing book about Robert Kraft and the Patriots organization when he still feels like he'll be coaching in the league next year because that would just start a just a storm of crap. And that's not what Belichick wants. He don't want to put that in the lap of his new owner. Hey, how about you hire me so everybody can ask me about that book I just wrote, burning the, the, the Gillette Stadium facility down to the ground. I don't think that's happening anytime soon. All right, he's Greg. I'm Nick. We'll be back later this week uh, with more Patriot stuff. Every, you know, Things are flying every single day, so we'll have something to talk about, I'm sure. Until then, be well. <laughs>